I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> Little Miss Holly, how are you today? I don't think I've ever been so anxious. And what are you so anxious about? Well, today Rusty Rowley is supposed to ride in the race to try to win the thousand dollars so he can give the money to Mrs. Jones. And then that mean Mr. Marlowe can't take her farm away from her. And oh, I just can't wait to see if Rusty wins. Well, let's not waste any time at all. Let's start immediately at once, right now, fast. Oh, please, quick, read me the funny. Puck the comic weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <whistles> it's another typical day for Beetle Bailey in the Army. He and his pals are scrubbing up the barracks because today the captain is going to inspect it. And if it isn't perfectly spick and span and cleaner than any boys or girls room in the country, the captain is going to be M-A-D, which spells furious. Suddenly, one of the G.I.s pops in the door. Hey, aren't you guys ready yet? The captain's coming to inspect right now. One of the guys shoves his mop in Beetle's locker. Beetle tosses his scrub pail out the window. And then the barrack door opens. And stunt! And Beetle looks up, third picture top row, to see the captain standing in the door, soaking wet, with the pale Beetle threw out the window on his head. Uh-oh, I bet this will be a top inspection. As everybody stands at attention, the captain walks around the room, examining it carefully. Suddenly he stops. What is this? The sergeant, squinting his eyes to see it, answers, It's a piece of thread, sir. The captain bends down picks up a little tiny piece of thread. And last picture, Top Row exclaims, Rope on the floor! The sergeant marks it down on his pad. The uh, yes, sir. First picture, bottom row, the sergeant exclaims, uh, Here's an orange seat on Bailey's shelf, sir. The captain roars, Garbage on the furniture! And then, next picture, the captain roars, That window is filthy! Yeah, but it's open, Captain. The sergeant exclaims, Darguing with an officer, and writes it down. Then the captain walks over to Beetle's locker and he says, Let's just see what shape Bailey's locker is in. He opens the locker, and the wet mop falls out, <laughs> smacking him in the face. This is too much! And he starts for Beetle, who pops out the window. <laughs> and last picture, the rest of the men in the barracks stare out the window as the captain tries to catch Beetle. One of the men says, Hey, what's the captain doing now? About 30 miles an hour. Another guy says, Hey, what's Beetle doing? And another one answers, He's doing his best to stay ahead of that mop the captain is swinging, huh? <laughs> oh, poor Beetle. <laughs> you certainly got in trouble today. <laughs> yes, just because somebody stuck a mop in his locker. <laughs> oh, and didn't that captain look when he came in the door with the pail on his head. You bet he did. <laughs> but that began the trouble for Beetle. I'm sure it did, too. Well, now let's turn over the page to Prince Valiant. Oh, yes, because the mean men have captured little Prince Arn. They've gone away with him. And last week, Tillicum, the Indian maid who was Prince Arn's nurse, started after him. And she followed their trail through the forest until nighttime. And then she smelled horses. And that means she might be coming close to those bad men. Oh, I wonder if she'll catch up to them today. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Grey, Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> it's nightfall, and Tillicum can't follow the trail in the dense black of the forest, so she builds a fire because the mosquitoes fill the air. 
and Tillicum had taken off her long skirt so she could run swiftly. And smoke is the only way she can protect herself from the mosquitoes in the night. Then she lies down to sleep to gain strength to continue the chase tomorrow. Meanwhile, Boltar, who had discovered the absence of Tillicum and Little Arn, had called for a search. He and his men had followed Arn's and Tillicum's tracks in the forest. He had found Arn's bow. Then a little farther on, Tillicum's skirt. She had been wise enough to leave a trail for him to follow. And with torchbearers to lead the way, Boltar has followed her trail all through the night. But finally, the torchbearers fall back exhausted. Boltar continues on alone by moonlight. Last picture, second row, following Tillicum by the trail she has made. Broken twigs to mark her path. First picture, bottom row, he finds where there are no twigs on the bare mountain. Her headband. And then her bracelet. And then little bits of clothing that he had torn off. And on Boltar strides, following her trail through the night. Next morning, Tillicum awakens at the exact moment when there is light enough to follow the trail. Quickly, she washes at a nearby stream. And after a refreshing drink, she scoops up some mushrooms, berries, and fern roots, and last picture is on her way. It's easy to follow the trail of the four horses, and nowhere does she see signs of their being pastured, and she knows she must outlast the horses. Oh, I wish Bolter had caught up to Tillicum before she woke up. Yes, because running swiftly as she is, she's apt to leave Bolter quite far behind. But, but maybe find her campfire, and then he'll know just about what time she started in the morning, and if he hurries, he can still catch up with her. Well, let's hope so, because she'll need the strength of a man like Boltar to help her. But we'll find that out next week. Now let's turn over the page. Oh, look, on page five, there's Robin Hood, and I'm anxious to read that today because you remember that mean Prince John is going to try to hold up the wagon that's hauling the gold that's supposed to be used to buy King Richard's freedom because King Richard is a prisoner in a far-off country. Yes, and King John's men, led by the Sheriff of Nottingham, are going to dress like Robin Hood's men, and he hopes that Robin Hood will be blamed for the robbery. But Robin Hood has learned what his plan is, and I'm sure Robin Hood will come, and then there will be a big battle, and I'm anxious to see how it will end. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. Some music. Hi-ho! <laughs> Through the forest, second picture, first row, the procession bearing the gold to buy King Richard's freedom, accompanied by the Queen of England, approaches the spot where the Sheriff of Nottingham's men wait in ambush. Suddenly, there's a shout. No! And the sheriff's men, dressed like Robin Hood's outlaws, burst out of the bushes and dash for the wagon, carrying the gold. Last picture, top row, the archbishop, who's riding with the queen's guard, says, In the name of the king, stand aside and let us pass. One of the sheriff's men shouts, We own no king save Robin Hood! Switch the wing! First picture, bottom row, the sheriff's men attack the queen's guard. Others of his men leap on the wagon to remove the chest of gold. Second picture, bottom row, the archbishop draws his sword. One of the sheriff's men aims his bow at him, but before the murderous bowman can release his shaft, he is toppled by his swifter arrow. Oh! At last picture, out of the forest comes Robin Hood and his men. We're just in time, lads! Have at him! Ooh, hooray, hooray! Robin Hood got there in time! Yes, in time to save the archbishop's life. And now, I just hope they chase all the sheriff's men away and then... Prove to the queen that Robin Hood is loyal to the queen and King Richard. Yes, but if Robin Hood and his men aren't defeated by the sheriff's men, that will happen. And I just hope we'll find that out next week. Oh, I'm sure we will. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, Donald Duck. And I know you love Donald Duck, so here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squee jump, squee jump, squiddly chicka chat. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald wants to take a nap today, and to make sure he won't be interrupted, he puts a sign beside the doorbell. The sign reads, Don't ring bell. Invalid sleeping. A short time later, Donald is sound asleep. Suddenly, Donald wakes with a start and dashes to the door. And he sees a salesman standing there, and he yells, Can't you read? I'm an invalid. Squam! And he slams the door shut. He starts for his couch again, last picture top row, when... 
And by the time you get to the first picture bottom row, Donald has the door open and he's sticking a shotgun in the salesman's tummy. Aye! The salesman says, and away he goes. <laughs> by this time, Donald is disgusted because no one will pay any attention to his sign. So he says, This requires drastic action. He gets out a battery, wires, hooks the wires from the battery to the doorbell, and then third picture bottom row with a big grin waits for someone to ring his doorbell again because this time the one who does is going to get the shock of his life. Then... <coughs> when Donald opens his door, there lies his girlfriend Daisy on the doorstep holding up a sore hand. And as Donald stares in amazement, suddenly... Ah, stop, Daisy! Stop! <coughs> And last picture, Donald is in bed with an ice pack on his head. His nephew Dewey leans over his bed, and this is what he said. What's the matter, Uncle Donald? Aren't you sleepy? Got some ice cubes and pipe down. <laughs> oh, poor Donald. Isn't it a shame that his girlfriend Daisy is the one who got the shock? Yes, because she probably <laughs> wanted to come in and nurse the poor little invalid. <laughs> well, Donald is an invalid now, but I'll bet you she won't nurse him this time. <laughs> no, I'll bet she won't either. Well, now let's go to the last page of the first section. Oh, look, here's Flash Gordon. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, well, my lady. Rigga digga doon doon, saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash, Dale, and their friend, Dr. Zarkov, have been captured by an Earthman who has managed to set himself up as King Stang of the planet Venus. Carried by strange creatures with huge wings, they approach an amazing castle surrounded by a river of liquid fire. Stang, spurred on by a small jet motor, sails through the air beside them. Flying high over the searing moat of liquid fire, Flash's captors tow him to the entrance of King Stang's palace. It is a weird, colorful hothouse, a city in itself, providing shelter and stored up sunlight for comfortable living on this dripping cloud and gulf planet. As Flash is whisked through the hatch-like entrance, he catches a glimpse of Dale and Zarkov close behind him. Last picture, top row. Stang settles himself into a chair, then smiles coldly and commands, Zarkov, you will labor in the power room. Dale... You will try your skill in the royal kitchen. And then Stang turns to Flash. First picture, bottom row. Gordon, my wife, Queen Vicky, is about to make a journey to the food forests. You will go along to protect her against our enemies, the blue ones. And remember, Dale remains as hostage. Flash's first impulse is to draw his hidden ray gun and blaze away at the arrogant Stang. But discretion stays his hand and he meekly accompanies Queen Vicky as she sets out to direct the harvesting of the weak supply of food and precious oil. Last picture. Soaring above the toiling tree men in Vicky's jet wagon, Flash questions her about the blue ones. The queen shivers and says that they're frightful creatures like huge jellyfish, cruel and cunning. Intent on watching the harvesters, Flash and Vicky fail to see the pale blue shapes lurking in the wet forest. Ooh, I almost wish that Flash had pulled his gun and killed that mean King Stang dead. I don't like him. Yes, but I imagine if Flash had done that, then he would have quickly been surrounded by King Stang's men and Flash himself might have been killed. Yes, I suppose so. But I wonder what those blue ones really are like. Well, we'll find out more about them next week. Now it's time to go to the first page of the second section. Oh, yes, because there's Dagwood and Blondie, and I just love Dagwood. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ram a food, ram a fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> the Bumsteads are shopping today, and while they're in a store, Dagwood's daughter says, Daddy, you promised to let me buy skates with the money I saved. Dagwood replies, All right, we'll do it right now. So they go to the toy department. <laughs> and there they look at some skates. The salesman says, uh, the skates are $2. They're just what I want. 
And Dagwood whispers, Hey, Cookie, wait. Don't buy them. And Dagwood takes Cookie out of the store. The last picture, top row, Dagwood says to Cookie when they're outside, If you look around a bit, you'll get them cheaper than that. First picture, next row, they're in another store. The sales lady shows Cookie a pair of skates. They're $1.95. That's cheaper, Daddy. Psst. Cookie, come on, come on. Cookie looks up in surprise. Dagwood leads her out of the store. And when they're outside, he tells her, We'll find you skates that are even cheaper than that. Blondie tells Cookie that they'll show her how to shop carefully and save money. Last picture, second row, Cookie stops in front of a toy store that has a pair of skates in a window. Look, Daddy, they're just $1.85 cents here. Oh, no, no, come on, come on. Now, we can do even better than that. Whereupon, Cookie starts to cry. First picture, third <laughs> row. <laughs> My feet hurt. Blondie reminds Cookie that a penny <laughs> saved is a penny earned. And Dagwood says, <laughs> now, be patient, Cookie. We'll save you some money. I don't want to save money. I just want skates. <laughs> Dagwood leads Cookie into another store. All right, come on, come on. We'll try this place. Blondie goes off down the street. Uh, what can I do for you, sir? Uh, we'd like to look at some skates. Oh, uh, very well. Um, here's a very nice pair. How much? The man answers. Last picture, third row. A uh, dollar seventy. That's the cheapest yet. All right, go ahead. Buy those. First picture, bottom row. Dagwood and Cookie come out of the store with the skates. Dagwood says. Now, see, you saved yourself 30 cents by being patient. Thanks, Daddy, for the lesson in shopping. Suddenly, Blondie dashes around the corner. <laughs> and she tells Dagwood there's a big sale on women's suits around the corner and asks for $30 quick. Dagwood goes. And last picture, Dagwood's in the women's shop as Blondie tries on her new suit. Dagwood hands the sales lady $30. And Cookie says... We're saving a lot of money today, aren't we, Mama? And Blondie replies... We certainly are, dear. And Dagwood, thinking of the $30 he just paid out, grinds his teeth in anger. <laughs> That's funny. Dagwood works so hard to try to save 30 cents, and he ends up by spending $30. <laughs> yes, his looking from one store to the other brought Blondie to the place where she could see the suits that were on sale. <laughs> where Dagwood never wins. No, oh, no, Dagwood never wins. But you will if you turn over the page, because now it's time for Roy Rogers. Oh, there he is on page three, and he's starting a new adventure today, and I'm anxious to see what happens to Roy. Very well, here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip by yo now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo Roy has arrived in Pine City. He's talking to his friend, the sheriff. They're standing in front of the bank, which is boarded up, and the sheriff is explaining. Well, the last robbery broke the bank, Roy. This town faces ruin. Roy replies. Well, there must be some way to get to this Sphinx gang who did this job and break it up, Sheriff. Well, they fought it up in an old mission. Impossible to get in. Roy decides to see what he can do to help the Sheriff run down the gang. He mounts his horse, third picture top row, and says to the Sheriff, uh, Here's my plan, Sheriff. I'll pose as a wanted man and try to get into the gang. The Sheriff replies, I hate to give up, Roy, but if you fail... I'll have to ask the governor for the militia. A little later, last picture top row, Roy is galloping toward the gang's hideout. A tough-looking hombre lurking on the ledge above the road sees Roy approaching. He says to himself, Well, first time I ever seen an owl hoot heading for the Sphinx's gang hideout alone. Hey, he must be a new recruit. First picture, bottom row, as Roy passes under the ledge. The man drops the lasso over Roy's shoulders. Hey, hey, somebody's trying to hog time me. Hey, Trigger, run! <laughs> ah, there ain't no horse strong enough to pull Brimstone Barlow off his feet. <laughs> Barlow braces his feet against the ledge. Trigger lunges forward. That's it, Trigger. He left to let go now. <laughs> Suddenly, there's a sharp crack. Barlow yells. Hey, hey, the ledge is giving way! Run, run, run. At last picture, Barlow lies beside the road, pinned beneath pieces of the broken ledge. Bless you, you'll pay for this. Roy answers, give me those guns. 
And then he sees that the barrels of the guns are plugged. And Roy exclaims, Hey, what kind of a bandit are you? Plugged guns can't fire. Why, that man must have been crazy to try to have a tug of war with Trigger. Why, yes, he found out the hard way that he'd picked the wrong horse. I'm surprised he wasn't killed by the pieces of rock that fell all around him. Me too. I can't understand what he was up to or why his gun barrels are plugged. I can't understand that either. What kind of an odd lie is he? Well, next week, maybe we'll find out. Now let's turn over to the last page of all and Dick's adventures. And I'm anxious to read that because Dick is in the early days of America in the American Navy with Lieutenant Oliver Perry. And the Americans are at war with the English. And at the moment, Dick is on board the newly built American ship that's called the Lawrence. And it was prepared to engage the British ship in battle. And the British ship was outside the harbor, and it was waiting for the American ship to come out. But a terrible thing has happened. You bet it is terrible. Lieutenant Perry started to sail his ship out of the harbor, and she got stuck on a sandbar. Oh, if the British take them now, they, they could just blow the American ship to pieces. But I wonder what's going to happen. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's Adventures. And say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack is Let's have music, music for adventurous, adventurous Dick. Dick. As Perry realizes his ship is stuck on the sandbar, he's sure he'll be attacked by the British. Last picture top row, a single gesture from Perry sends every man swiftly and noiselessly to his battle station aboard the unmovable man of war. Not a man among them but expects the next instant to be blown into kingdom come. First picture, second row, they silently stand by, waiting for the attack which they are sure will come, waiting to fight back with every ounce of powder and every nerve in their bodies. There's an ominous wait. But from the outer darkness, where the British cannon should be blasting fire, not a sound comes. Another silent gesture from Perry sends Dick, last picture, second row, racing up the rigging to see if he can, why the British are passing up this perfect opportunity to destroy the helpless American ship. First picture, bottom row, Dick stares through the darkness. And then he can hardly believe his own eyes. In the pale moonlight, he sees the British fleet sailing away. And he shouts, They're hauled down and heading toward Canada! Then Dick scrambles down the rigging, a relieved smile on his face. And then to his crew, changed suddenly from men about to die to men alive with joy, Perry Riley announces, My impression, gentlemen, that our enemy has sailed off to attend a banquet to celebrate the king's birthday and to give us a chance to get off this blasted sandbar. Oh, wasn't that lucky? I wonder if it really was the king's birthday. Oh, yes, it really was. And just because the English sailors decided to celebrate the king's birthday, they missed their chance to attack Perry. Yes, and let's hope by next week that Perry gets his ship off the sandbar so he'll be in a position to fight the British on their own terms. Oh, I hope he can. Now, please read me Rusty Riley because this is going to be the day when the race is supposed to be run. Yes, the day when Rusty has his chance to win the $1,000 to give to Mrs. Jones. And then she won't have to turn her farm over to that skin-flint, greedy old Mr. Marlow. So quick, read, please. Very well, here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty is mounted on his horse, Space Pilot. His friend Pete says excitedly, All right, come on, Rusty, it's almost time for the race. Rusty answers, Well, okay, Pete. Gee, it's too bad I don't have a jockey suit, but, well, I guess that won't bother Space Pilot. And their friend Stovepipe, who has been such a big help to the boy, smiles, Success, my lad, success. Rusty joins the line of horses, moving toward the track. He smiles nervously to Pete, who is trotting along beside well, wish us luck, Pete. We've just got to get that money to save the farm for Nell and her mother. Well, I'm pulling for you, Rusty, and I'll be right in the front of the grandstand. Mr. Stovepipe somehow got a couple of box seats. A few minutes later, last picture top row, Stovepipe and Pete are in their seats in the grandstand, watching the horses as they approach the post. Stovepipe smiles... 
Ah, excellent seats, excellent seats. Reminds me of my private box at Ascot. Ah, my boy, this is truly the sport of kings. Especially one has a uh, proprietary interest in one of the entries. Pete answers, well, Rusty and I are, aren't thinking about the fun. It's Nell's mother. Oh, jeepers, they're ready to start. And then... They're off! And first picks about him roll. The horses leap from the starting post with a thunder of hoofs. Rusty is in second place as they go to the first turn. The jockey riding beside Rusty says to himself, I, I thought this kid on my left would be a pushover. But he's got a horse. And he can ride him. And Rusty shouts, All right, come on, come on, space pilot. In the grandstand, Stovepipe leans forward excitedly. Come on, Rusty. Ah, come on, my boy. By Jove, that chap in the red and yellow silk is leading by half a length. And Rusty can't close up an inch. Last picture, the horses come into the home stretch. Rusty leans over Space Pilot's neck. And he says in Space Pilot's ear, Please, Space Pilot, if you never win another race, please win this one. Now, don't get so excited. We'll find out for sure next week what happens. Oh, but I'll go out of my mind worrying until next week. Seven days. Seven days he just got to win. Well, you'll have to spend seven days crossing your fingers for Rusty. But I wonder if I can wait. Well, we'll see you next week what happens. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Honey and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Connie Greekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man... The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.